I remember seeing a post from Gordon Weatherby a while ago about the first communion in space. So I did some research on it, and on July 20th, 1969, astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had to do something hard. They had to wait. They were scheduled to open the door of their lunar lander and step out onto the unknown surface of a completely different world. But for now, their mission ordered them to take a pause before the big event. And so Aldrin spent this time doing something unexpected, something no man had ever attempted before. Alone and overwhelmed by anticipation, he took part in the first Christian sacrament ever performed on the moon, communion. Now Aldrin's lunar communion has since become shrouded in mystery and confusion, but the, the rite itself was relatively simple. The astronaut was also an elder at the, Western, uh, the Webster Presbyterian Church, and before he headed into space in 1969, he got special permission to take bread and wine with him to space and give himself communion. Now, the mood on the module was sober, and both Armstrong and Aldrin knew how important their mission was. I was certainly aware that this was a culmination of the work of 300,000 or 400,000 people over a decade, and that the nation's hopes an outward appearance largely rested on how the results came out, Armstrong recalled later. Now as the men prepared for the next phase of their mission, Aldrin got on the comm system and spoke to the ground crew back on Earth. And he said, I would like to request a few moments of silence. I would like to invite each person listening in, whichever or whomever he may be, to contemplate for a moment the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his own individual way. He then reached out uh, for the wine and bread and he brought into space with him the first foods ever poured or eaten on the moon. He said, I poured the wine into the chalice our church had given me and in the one-sixth gravity the moon, uh, on the moon, the wine curled slowly and gracefully in the side of the cup, he later wrote. Then Aldrin read some scripture from the Gospel of John and ate. So Buzz Aldrin wanted to take time right before he and Neil walked on the moon to remember all that God had done for him, to remember, even in the midst of one of the greatest accomplishments of, of mankind, that Jesus Christ accomplished all that he did on the cross, and that always took precedent. He took the bread and the juice and, and remembered the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus and, and recognized it as, as the most important event in all of history. You know, as, as we gather here today, whether uh, you're, you're at home watching or wherever you are, we remember that in all that is going on in our lives, Jesus has to take precedent. His broken body and his shed blood freed us from the bondages of sin and, and give us hope of eternal life. Now at this time, I'm going to, to pray over these emblems, which represent just that, and, and pray over those of yours at home. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do take precedent in our lives, that no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening in our lives, big or small, that we have to remember all that you have accomplished for us, that, that we can live free from the bondage of sin because of Christ's broken body and his shed blood, which was broken and shed for us. God, I pray that we would never take that for granted. God, bless these emblems which represent that. And Lord, bless it to our bodies and let us always remember all that you do for us every single day. We thank you for it. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
There are times in my life where I feel like my children, Kaylin and Emerson, are little angels. Uh, I hear them outside playing together, coming up with some imaginary game as they run around the yard laughing, or, or, or we're over to somebody's house visiting and they say please and they say thank you and, and behave like we've actually succeeded as parents. And in those times, I feel a tremendous sense of, of pride and, and joy. And there are times when they, they don't act like little angels and they're, they're at each other and pushing and shoving and being mean and, and saying things to each other to, that, you know, just get a rise out of one another. And, or we're out at somebody's house and they forget all the manners that, that we've told them. And I think, man, my wife is failing as a parent. Now, you know, there's, there's a reason they act like that, and, and there's a reason we all act those two different ways, sometimes doing good and other times doing bad. There's a war within us. You know, I heard a, a story about a, a young Native American boy whose heart was raging over the injustice and persecution and prejudice he experienced in his life, and he, he was filled with hurt and anger and bitterness and a desire for revenge. He knew it wasn't right to let those feelings eat at him, and it just made him even more miserable. But he didn't know what to do about it. At last, he confided in his grandfather, a, a wise old man who always seemed at, at peace. And he, you know, have you ever felt this way, Grandpa? He asked. His grandfather answered, in, in my heart are two wolves, a white wolf and a black wolf. Every day they fight for control over my heart. Which one is stronger, asked the boy. Which one is going to win? His grandfather replied, whichever one I feed. And we're all like that. We all have a white wolf and a black wolf at war within us, good versus bad, constantly at war within one another. You know, the, the Apostle Paul spoke about this very thing in Romans 7, 18 and 19. Romans chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. And it says, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. You know, Paul struggled with, with doing the right thing. And like many of us, it, it was a struggle within that Paul had to deal with. So let's look at, at the, the two wolves at, at war within us and what the Bible says about those two natures. So firstly, the, the bad wolf, the carnal nature, the, the bad wolf. Let's look at what Paul says to the Christians in Rome again, but in chapter 3, verses 9 to 12. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. And he says, What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Ouch. You know, Paul doesn't pull any punches here. His letter to the, the Romans covered a lot of ground before this verse. He, he talked to the, the Romans about how faithful God is and, and how incredible his mercy is. And the reason God faithfulness, God's faithfulness is so amazing is because he tells the Romans, none of you are righteous, not even one of you. You don't understand God. You don't seek his face. You've all turned away from him. You've all become worthless. You don't do any good. When left to your own devices, Paul tells them that they are so full of sin and so full of the world that they are of no use to God. Paul is, is warning them and cautioning them not to get full of themselves. See, the, the church in Rome was thinking that they were doing actually a really good job. They were thinking that as far as Christians go, they, they were awesome and they were the elite. They made the, the big mistake of thinking that their faith was strong because of what they were, they were doing. You know, Paul sees differently. They, they've walked away from God because they're, they're following their own carnal nature. They're following their own selfish desires and sin abounds within them. And the wages of sin is death, the Bible says, and death in sin leads to an eternity in hell. And Paul is, is very blunt with them. They all have this evil nature inside of them that's warring to come out, and they all have potential for good inside of them as well. But the Romans were letting their, their carnal nature take over. They were losing that battle over good. Now, I remember when I was about 
11 or, or 12 years old, my mom had made a, a chocolate cake uh, and it had peanut butter frosting on it, which is one of my favorites by far. She had made the cake for, for a party or a baby shower or something, and, and then she had to run to town to get something else. So I was home alone with Dad, and Dad went outside to do some yard work, and, and lo and behold, I was alone. Well, not totally alone. It was me and the cake. And I tried to resist, but alas, I was weak, and I ate literally over half of the cake by myself in one sitting. And I knew I wasn't supposed to. I knew mom had made it for something else for a very specific reason that afternoon, but I ate it anyway. I knew I wasn't supposed to, but I ate it. You know, we all have that same human carnal nature inside of us, just like the Roman Christians. And unfortunately, society, through most forms of media, TV, commercials, Facebook ads, Twitter, whatever, all feed into that carnal nature. The, the desires and the greed and the, the commercialism to have more and more stuff, to have, have more stuff than, than your neighbors. You know, it feeds into the, the sensual and immoral desires of the human nature. You know, everywhere we look today, our carnal human nature, the bad wolf within us is being fed. As Christians, we need to be very careful of what we're allowing ourselves to see, you know, to be a part of, to, to participate in. You know, like, like the Roman Christians, we need to be sure that we don't get so comfortable in our faith that we, we get thinking it's about us and about how, how great we are because that feeds into that carnal ego and, and very quickly we can walk away from God and find ourselves in, in a dangerous place, a constant battle. You know, the, the bad wolf within is, is constantly trying to, to come to the surface, constantly warring with you to follow your instincts, to selfishly take care of yourself, to, to look after yourself above everyone and everything else, that you know what's best for you and, and God doesn't. Don't allow that human nature to have a voice in your life. Don't allow that wolf to stay inside and be fed. Don't allow that wolf to have a say in how you act and in what you do. So firstly, we, we looked at what Paul says to the Romans and to us today, today about our carnal nature, the, the big wolf, the bad wolf within us. Now let's look at, at what he says about the good wolf, the, the godly nature, the good wolf. Turn with me to Paul's letter to the church in Galatia, in Galatians 6, 7 to 10. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 to 10. And it says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So Paul's letter to the church in Galatia is a little more, a little more gentle than his letter to the church in Rome, but it touches on a lot of the same topics. You know, Paul tells them here in, in this passage that you have the ability to do good, but you also have the ability to do evil as well. You know, he relates life to the farming. You reap what you sow. If, you know, if they fight their human nature and cultivate their good nature through Christ, then they will begin to see the fruits of their labor eventually. You know, it's hard work fighting against their, their human nature, but it's important that they do it, that they put in the hard work. You know, he's encouraging them not to grow weary in doing the right thing, not to grow weary of following God's word, not to grow weary in denying their carnal nature and feeding their lives through the spirit of God instead. Paul's telling them and warning them that it's easy to give in. It's easy to allow the, the bad wolf uh, to have uh, you know, surface in their lives. It's easy to be selfish, to give in to the temptations of sin. It's easy to make small compromises and slowly walk away and, and do their own thing. You know, that's the easy road. But Paul is encouraging them to stand strong, to fight against their evil nature and stay connected to God. And he will help build up their godly nature. He will give them a great harvest in their own lives if they stay strong in their faith. You know, do good to people. To the people around Galatia won't see it coming. Paul is, is telling them that. that you know, the, the people there expect them to be selfish and, and, and carnal like everybody else. But Paul knew 
that it would be a huge witness to Christ if the Christians there were nice and kind and compassionate and did good even to the people who didn't deserve it. You know, allow the good wolf to, to come to the surface in all of those circumstances Paul is telling them. You know, I heard the story of a, a missionary to remote villages in China in the 1800s. He was a young man when he first arrived with big dreams of, of preaching the gospel and changing people's lives. But he found a very harsh welcome. He was persecuted every single day. He, he struggled to make ends meet. He didn't have any friends. But day after day, day after day, he continued. He would help feed the poor and he would lend a helping hand to, to farmers and, and tell people about the love of Jesus Christ and his gospel message whenever he could. It wasn't well received, but he did it anyway. But people didn't, didn't care what he was saying. People didn't pay any attention to him. It was hard for the young missionary. You know, he, he contemplated leaving many, many times, going somewhere where the word of God might be better received. But he purposed in his heart to remain and to, to be joyful anyway. To keep doing what he knew God was calling him to do. To, to remain showing the love of God regardless of how poorly he was being treated. Year after year went by without a single convert. But still, he kept joy in his heart and showed God's love wherever he went. Then nearly 40 years, after 40 years of no results, 40 years of preaching... 40 years of helping and preaching and loving with only receiving hate and pain in return. Revival broke out amongst the remote villages and God moved in powerful ways that are still going on today. The young missionary could have you know, fed into the hate and the persecution and the pain he was receiving and cultivated it in his heart. But he chose to cultivate God's love inside of him regardless of the outcome that he was and he was eventually blessed for it. It took nearly 40 years, but God won, and good came to the surface. Now, just like the church in Galatia that Paul wrote about and the young missionary in China, we too have the ability to cultivate and encourage our heavenly nature within inside of us, our godly nature, the, the good wolf within. But it's up to us. We need to continue to do good even though it's difficult. We need to respond like God wants us to, even in the, the midst of, of chaos going on around us. When the world around us is focusing on being selfish and, and doing everything you have to get ahead, we need to focus on helping others, you know, putting others' needs above our own, sharing the love of Christ with the people around us, even if they've done wrong to us. You know, it's, it's contrary to what the world would think, and it's contrary to how the world works. Most people won't repay evil with good. Most people won't help people if there's, there's nothing in it for them. Most people show kindness to people who have done something uh, good in their lives, but not to people who have wronged them. But we aren't called to be like most people. We're called to be in this world, but not of this world. We are called to stand out. We're called to allow the love of Christ to flow through us to the world around us. We're called to work hard and, and, and purposely uh, being good. You know, it's difficult to deny that, that bad wolf inside of us. It's difficult to continue to do good when we, we really don't feel like it. But when you do, little by little, it becomes easier. Little by little, it becomes like second nature. Then eventually, it becomes our only nature. Don't grow weary of doing good, Paul said. God will reward you. You will reap what you sow. Make sure that you are sowing well. In closing, you know, back up to the parable I read at the first, you know, we, we all have those two wolves warring inside of us, the, the bad wolf and the good wolf, so how do we know which wolf wins? It's the wolf that you feed. If you don't feed the one wolf, it will become weak and tired and eventually won't be able to stand up against the other. But be sure that you're feeding the right wolf. Don't feed your carnal nature. Don't allow the world to get inside of you. Don't give in to the nature that takes away from the Lord. You know, feed the good wolf. Feed it with scripture. Feed your, your godly nature every day. Continue to walk with the Lord. Continually stay connected with him. Continually doing good even when it's hard and not easy. Get into his word. And over time, as you feed your life and feed, fill your life with more and more of God and his word and his ways, you'll find it becomes easier and easier. Feed that nature within you. Feed the right wolf and it will win. 
Maybe this morning you're watching and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Surrendering your life to Jesus is the most important decision you can ever make in your entire life. Contact me or, or another believer that can help. You will never, ever regret it. But maybe you're, you've been serving Christ for a while, but you, you find that the carnal nature is, is winning. You find yourself losing that battle. I want to encourage you this morning to keep on battling. Keep feeding the good inside of you and deny the bad. Keep doing good even when it's hard. God will strengthen you. He will help you and he will guide you every day. Keep your hand in his. Get into his word constantly. Pray continually and never forget that God loves you.